Hello, uh, my name is Craig Camp. I'm general manager of, of Troon Vineyard here in Oregon's Applegate Valley. And this is another episode of Troon Talk where we dig deeper into our farming and winemaking here at Troon Vineyard. And today our uh, guest is Garrett. Garrett Long is our director of agriculture. Now we started this process uh, transforming to, to biodynamics and regenerative agriculture in 2017. And each year you layer more things on and more things in your project becomes more complex. And we realized we really needed a, an on-site expert to, to take the role and to, to lead us to that next level. So uh, Garrett joined us uh, last year and has just made uh, tremendous strides for us uh, in, in, in the time he's been here. So, so Garrett, I'm gonna ask you to start and tell us a little bit about your background your, and your voyage to arrive at Troon Vineyard. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you so much, Craig, and thank you for the kind words, kind introduction. Um, I got my start in farming and in biodynamics right about 10 years ago. In 2012, I found a farm to go volunteer at through WOOF for the Worldwide Opportunities on Organic Farms. And I went to volunteer at Apricot Lane Farms, which is in Ventura County, about an hour outside of Los Angeles. And I thought I was going for a three month volunteer gig. And as it turned out, I stayed for about the next seven years. I did my master's degree at UC Davis in soil science during that seven year period and then returned back to Apricot Lane to continue farming there. Um, it was an extremely formative experience. Um, I worked seven days, or excuse me, six days a week. Uh, we worked early mornings, long days alongside the farmers and it was my first experience in agriculture and I really learned a ton. I fell in love with soil science fell in love with soil, <laughs> fell in love with animals, with sowing seeds, with watching cover crops grow, with watching animals graze. It was a really amazing experience to be on a farm for the first time and to be ingratiated into a system that was conceived as this whole farm organism that is biodynamic. And I had some really wonderful mentors along the way that really inspired both a greater understanding and a deeper appreciation that I've developed for biodynamics, for connecting with seasonal rhythms, for really understanding these relationships between plant, animal, mineral, you know, this etheric and sort of cosmic connection to farming, the spiritual connection to farming. And um, we had some really wonderful mentors. One of them uh, is Andrew Beatty, who is actually a consultant on this project here at Troon Vineyard, and has been involved in guiding that transition to biodynamic agriculture. And Andrew and I have collaborated on a number of projects between 2012 and now. Um, there was a project in Napa County where we were building a biodynamic farm on another estate vineyard. And uh, when that project came to a close last year, Andrew suggested that I uh, look into this cool little farm in Southern Oregon that he had been working with and that he'd been telling me about for many years. And so um, I arrived here <laughs> in, uh, in August, 2021 right before harvest. So Apricot Lane is a, a very special place. Perhaps you could uh, just elaborate a little bit more about that project and what working there meant for you. Yeah, yeah, you bet. So Apricot Lane Farms was started just uh, about a year before I arrived and really st they started farming in earnest um, in 2012. Um, the, the owners uh, or the managers of the farm, John and Molly Chester, had uh, very different backgrounds from farming. John came from a filmmaking background and Molly was a private chef working with clients in LA. And they both had this desire to sort of get out of the city and go um, learn about farming and grow their own healthy food. And uh, with John's background in filmmaking, he was, the camera was rolling from the first time they went out and just looked at the farm. And over the 
about an eight-year process, eight-year period, they were filming the, this transition and it became a documentary film called The Biggest Little Farm that came out in 2018, which really captured that whole transition, the impact of using cover crops and integrating animals and planting diverse fruit orchards and a vegetable garden and taking what was essentially this old rundown citrus and avocado farm with a bunch of pastures that had horses in them for many years. It was all kind of run down and conventionally managed for about 50 years. Uh, as they changed over, John and Molly uh, brought in these really inspiring consultants and all together with the help of woofers like myself, volunteers, and a really um, amazing team that I learned so much from personally. Uh, we essentially regenerated this entire landscape, more than 200 acres, the farm uh, is comprised of, and it's about every kind of farm animal you could imagine. There was a hundred different varieties of fruit and nut trees, uh, you know, easily 100, 150 different things growing in the garden over the course of a single season. So just incredible diversity, uh, biodiversity, there was a huge component of uh, a huge interest in wildlife habitat restoration and conservation. And so um, that was also established on that farm. And what I really came to understand was the relationships and again, the, the connectivity between all of these seemingly disparate systems and seeing how they all related and harmonized one another was, was a really incredible experience. And uh, really lifted off my career into biodynamics and into agriculture. I uh, point out you can still watch that film. You can stream that uh, online. We encourage everyone to to take the time to do that. Uh, Absolutely. When did you become aware of biodynamics, and what do you think drew you to it? Well, it it it's. It's pretty clear to me, you know, I mentioned these different mentors. I mentioned Andrew, who was our garden and orchard manager at the time. He helped design and develop the whole garden and orchard system by being the boots on the ground, the, the, the manager on site. The other two consultants that we worked with had immense experience in biodynamics. And it was those two gentlemen who I really learned a lot from um, and, and who were the reason why I became interested in biodynamics in the first part, you know, in the first place. Um, Matthias Baker is somebody who I very much consider a mentor to this day. He uh, has been a practitioner in the Sacramento area, Northern California area, and worked with farms all over the world um, to really develop their prep making capacity. That's really his specialty is to take these biodynamic preparations that are really at the heart of biodynamics and set it apart from any other form of agriculture and to support farmers in their understanding of prep work and how preparation making is a reflection of the farmer, is a reflection of the rhythm of the seasons, um, and to better understand what was a lot of people may just perceive as maybe a recipe that Rudolf Steiner, who founded biodynamics, uh, laid out these you know, recipes for these eight things, eight, eight preparations. And what Matthias really did was, and continues to do to this day, is really experiment with different preps, you know, using herbs that are native to Northern California and processes that he's developed himself to really cultivate a deeper understanding of what Steiner was encouraging from biodynamic practitioners beyond just, hey, you know, Let's put, let's put cow manure in a cow horn. Let's, let's stuff some yarrow blossoms into other animal parts and to really explore these relationships on a deeper level. And I can think back to a moment when it really crystallized for me. Matthias and I would often, he joined us for dinner. You know, he'd come out for these two, three day sessions at a time. And we'd really take this deep dive into preparation making. And I can remember very clearly sitting with Matthias at the dinner table. It's at the end of a long work day. All of the woofers are there. John and Molly are there. And people would start peeling off. You know, they'd head home. They're tired. They're going to go get a shower. They're going to go get some rest. And Matthias and I would just talk. And I would learn so much from him. And 
I can remember vividly just sitting there watching the sun go down, watching just being totally lost and captivated with what he had to say and what he was teaching me that I didn't notice the passing of time pretty soon. It was so dark that we could hardly see each other across the table and it was way past bedtime, but I was just so uh, immersed in what he had to say. So he was an incredibly powerful mentor of mine and, and really inspired a, a deeper understanding of the preparations. And then I, it, just to speak briefly to the impact of Alan York on me specifically, um, Alan is more than just a character in the film, but he plays a prominent role in The Biggest Little Farm in terms of his relationship and in inspiring John and Molly and their understanding of biodynamics. And I think that they told a story that is reminiscent of how I viewed my relationship with Alan as well. Um, I remember telling Alan a story about one of the one of the things that really got me interested in, in farming in the first place and, you know, led me to come down to um, a biodynamic farm in Southern California was falling in love with working with plants in a greenhouse. And I remember over a meal, I was telling Alan about just getting lost and similar to my conversation with Matthias, just not noticing the passing of time, dinner time would come and go. And all of a sudden my, I was volunteering for six hours, just propagating succulents and cleaning up this, this, um, this greenhouse in this, uh, at a community college that I was working at. And Alan, he kind of had this funny way of talking to me. He's like, you know, that's, that's some of that 10,000 hour stuff. You know, that's, that's how you really know that you found your passion. And it really stuck with me that I was like, huh, I think you're right. If I can find something where I get so lost in it, that I don't notice the passing of time. There's, there's maybe something here for me. So Alan um, not only acknowledged what I maybe felt, but didn't see the potential in, in myself and my relationship with plants. Um, but he, he really did bring just this greater holistic understanding of how all of these systems fit together and taught me a lot about making compost and, and about the whole system. So you have a, uh, a, a master's degree in uh, cell science from UC Davis. Uh, how do you see science and biodynamics intertwining and, and working together? Some, some people tend to say they're, they're like exclude each other. And I don't think that's the way we practice it here. How do you, how do you uh, uh, combine the two? Yeah, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so I think going again, going back to something that Matthias said to me and encouraged in me. First and first and foremost, I mean, I guess I should say when I had vocalized an interest in going getting a graduate degree and I kind of passed it by these mentors of mine, Alan and Andrew and Matthias. They basically said, look, man, if you want to learn about farming, don't go to grad school, just farm, just stick it out. And I, for as much as I, you know, followed their wisdom and followed this path that they put me on, um, I did disregard that. And I did go pursue, um, uh, you know, higher education. Um, and something that Matthias told me is, sort of after the fact, or sort of once I was in it and I came back, you know, reflecting on all these things I was learning and just learning so much about soil formation and soils in different places and realizing that a lot of these principles that we are applying like cover crops and, and animal integration and no-till and all these things just made a lot of sense in the academic literature, that there's a real basis for them. And, and it's something that was very intuitive, I think in, in, in ancient farming practices and more traditional farming practices It's lost in our modern commercial industrial agriculture. But it was something that was very intuitive and was finding a, a, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, uh, proof uh, in, in the literature. And, and a greater understanding, I came back so excited to share all these things with, with, with Woofers, with John and Molly, with everybody, with my mentors. And, and it was only then that Matthias shared with me this reflection that Rudolf Steiner had a protege named Aaron Fried Pfeiffer. And Pfeiffer essentially, as I understand it, brought biodynamics to the US by way of New York. You know, there are other practitioners that left Europe, but um, Pfeiffer trained directly with Steiner and then has just a huge lineage of practitioners below him or beyond him. 
Pfeiffer was encouraged by Rudolf Steiner to pursue academics. You know, Steiner had this idea around spiritual science that was based in these qualitative measures and this understanding of relationships. And, and he encouraged Pfeiffer to go get that traditional um, education, learn about weight and measure and number and how to quantitatively measure things and things like that. And to bring that understanding back to biodynamics and really connect that to the spirituality, connect that to rhythms, to relationships. And it was Matthias who, who shared that with me and told me, well, maybe I should read this, this biography of Pfeiffer. Maybe there's something in that for me. And so um, that was a long-winded way of, of, I guess, just further talking about the things that it inspired me. But in regard to the connection between science and biodynamics, there is, there's a real quality to biodynamics that is difficult to measure, I think, with our, our best scientific instruments. There's, there's a qualitative force that is not well understood by um, a lot of biodynamic practitioners or academics. Um, and so it often gets written off as unscientific or there's, not, there's no basis to this. Um, but if you act to ask any biodynamic farmer after they've been doing this for five or 10 years and what changes they've experienced on their farm, what sort of deepening of their own relationship and their own commitment to stewardship of their land, the proof is in the pudding. You know, they, they might tell you that they're not sure why it works, but that there's definitely something to it. And so um, when I left Apricot Lane Farms about three years in to go to Davis and do my master's degree, I was really interested in, in studying biodynamics specifically and developing an experiment around better understanding something like horn manure or the preparations or biodynamic compost making. And um, I ended up focusing my research around compost tea as opposed to biodynamics. I think I was encouraged that in that academic setting that maybe biodynamics would be disregarded or looked down upon, especially at a big agriculture university like Davis, UC Davis, you know, a world leader in teaching and research related to agriculture, which it certainly is. Um, and so I, I sort of took this slightly divergent path to take a more traditional academic approach. And then like Pfeiffer brought that back to the farm to do, to conduct on-farm research and spent the next two and a half years as the research and outreach coordinator at Apricot Lane and really looking at the impacts of biodynamic practices on metrics of soil health, on the nutritional quality of, of the chicken eggs, of the avocados, the lemons that we were growing and, and doing real science. Um, which, which, was, um, which was really, really neat to be able to, um, to take, you know, I, well, I guess I sort of said it already, to take that, that really traditional academic understanding and to apply it onto a biodynamic farm that is often so misunderstood. Um, this is a process you're continuing here at Troon. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think you know, our, our, our best cutting edge science, our, our most sensitive instruments, our best line of questioning continues to develop. I think that's the beauty of the scientific method is you're constantly standing on the shoulders of giants and the other people who came before you and building off of their research programs and digging deeper into specific questions. And that's really something that I hope to do here. You know, we're, we're doing things like looking at, at, at the microbiome of our soil and how it relates to the chemistry of our wines, to the microbiology that are present in our, in our natural, you know, naturally fermented wines. And I think to look at, again, to study those relationships is to, is to, is to gain a better understanding of how life works. These, um, these sort of synergistic effects, be they supportive, be they antagonistic, synergistic, um, to better understand, you know, these microbial communities and 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 all of this is is something is a is a path that I yes I'm I'm very excited to continue working on here at Troon. I think there's a lot of really cool stuff that have already been started by the folks that came before me, and now I get to enter in and get to ask my own line of questioning uh, questions. Yeah. So you mentioned you were a woofer and woofer several times. You better explain what a woofer is. Sure. Yeah. So 
Worldwide Opportunities on Organic Farms is this international organization that uh, connects organic host farmers and folks like myself, oftentimes young people, folks who are looking for a career change, maybe more meaning in their life, or just an, an opportunity to go travel and uh, and to do a work exchange program. So, you know, there's there's host organic host farms all over the world. Um, you know, you could go to a, a vineyard in Tuscany. You could go to learn about cheese making in Switzerland. You could go to learn about sweet potato growing in Ghana. There's just um, farms all over the world that allow you to travel and do a work exchange. Um, you work and you get education about uh, organic farming and room and board. And uh, my commitment was three months. Other people stay for shorter stays, sometimes longer. And something that I really, it's a program that I really hope to work with and, and institute here at Troon as well. It, it was such a formative experience for me to sort of intern and, and apprentice and eventually level up to the point where I was running the program and could help ingratiate other young people or other folks who are just interested in, in biodynamics, interested in coming to Apricot Lane in that case. And it's something that I'd love to, a program that I'd love to start here at Troon too. We've got a big uh, garden coming up here. Got a big garden gonna need some, it's gonna need some extra hands, Craig. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, last year, Troon became the second winery in the world to become regenerative organics certified. And you were early, early involved in that and in, in development of that certification. Uh, how do you see that uh, uh, working in the future together with biodynamics and what it means to introduce some, a new certification? Yeah, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I've had lengthy conversations about the role of certifications on in, in agricultural operations. Um, uh, the regenerative organic certification, I helped pilot a program when I was at Apricot Lane Farms, um, 2017, I believe. Uh, we uh, joined the, the Regenerative Organic Alliance. You know, it was at the time sort of a conglomerate of, of Dr. Bronner's, of Patagonia, of a few other um, uh, folks who are sort of leading, leading uh, in sustainability um, in terms of big brands. And they were collaborating with the Rodale Institute and a few other individuals to develop a whole certification program that has become ROC today. Um, and they had asked Apricot Lane Farms, uh, which is just about 45 minutes up the road from the Patagonia headquarters in the flagship store in Ventura, um, California. They had asked Apricot Lane Farms if we would join the pilot program and give them feedback on it. And so I was there and working with the folks um, to pilot that program to give feedback on the on the um, on the on the framework, on the sets of standards, how difficult it is how uh, beneficial it is to, again, start to harmonize all these different aspects. Uh, ROC involves three pillars, which is soil health, animal welfare, and a social fairness or farmer, farmer and farm worker fairness pillar. And the, all three of those support each other. They are standalone certifications in a lot of cases, um, but ROC incorporates all three of them. Um, in a way that uh, creates, again, just more of a holistic understanding, a, a holistic commitment to sustainability, to social fairness, animal welfare. And these are all um, tenets that are similar to biodynamics as well. Um, the framework is a little bit different in terms of the certification. The standards are slightly different, but there is a ton of overlap. I think there's more in common between biodynamic certification and ROC than there are differences and I see, um, I see a real uh, potential to, to marry those certifications. Um, you know, again, biodynamics really brings in this spiritual component that is one of the unique things that sets it apart from ROC. And I think there's a real opportunity, especially with wine, for people to experience, to have maybe more of a spiritual connection to what they're eating or drinking that comes from a farm. And wine has this incredible ability to reflect terroir, to reflect place, 
the people, the soil, the climate, the culture that, 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 you know, created this, this wine. And, um, and I think there's a real, there's a real opportunity there um, for people who are maybe unfamiliar with wine to start to develop a deeper appreciation for it. And I think if I'm not mistaken, Craig, this is partly how your appreciation for biodynamics came about was the recognition that all these wines that you were really enjoying that were really compelling were, were biodynamic, right? Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, how do you see our, the our regenerative organic uh, pushing the, the, this whole process forward? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, sorry. Thank you for bringing me back on track. I, I, I have said this a lot. Um, I think, I think of ROC as really a, a North star. Uh, it is, it is the direction that I think we, we need to go as a species on this planet. The, uh, the slogan or the mantra of ROC is farm like the world depends on it. And this alliance has, has, has cultivated, has, has developed this, this framework for how we should be managing our farms, how we should be treating our workers and our animals, um, how we should develop a relationship with, with each other, how we should steward the environment, how we should be attentive about the inputs in our farms. And at its core is to demonstrate improvement every year. That's again, one of the unique things about ROC is to, is to prove through soil testing and in your practices that you're continually regenerating or making your farm better. You're increasing organic matter. You're irrigating less. You're tilling and disturbing the soil less. Um, and so it provides a framework for farmers who really want to make a difference to, uh, to really um, verify. I think that's, that's the unique thing about certification programs in general. You know, you can buy something at the farmer's market that's, quote, organically grown, but not verified by the USDA or another organic certifier. Um, and that's great. I totally support doing that. But I think to actually step through the verification process to maintain records to document our practices, the number of sprays we do, um, document our rotational grazing patterns and how long animals stay there. It's not just great data for us to understand how we can change our practices year to year, but how we can demonstrate that through a certification body, through a third party verification system. And somebody can, can see this label on you know, a bottle of wine or on a bag of rice or you know, the plethora of products that will be ROC certified in the future and feel that this is a, feel good about purchasing this product, feel like this is supporting, again, the animals and people and, and, and the environment. And, and ROC really provides that framework and that North Star, um, that really strict set of standards for people to, for, for farmers to try to achieve and for consumers to uh, support or to, to vote with their dollar to support this kind of farming. So you've had the deep experience in, in agriculture, but this is kind of your first deep dive into wine production. You got to work yes. harvest this year and all that. What kind of differences are you seeing that make uh, a place like Troon unique? Gosh, well, funny enough, we were talking just earlier today, Craig, you and I, about how I have become, I've been ruined <laughs> by drinking good wine, by being exposed to good natural wine has, has ruined me to the rest of the wine industry. And now I'm spending too much on a bottle of wine um, for any old Wednesday night. Um, so it, it, besides just developing a real appreciation for um, good quality wine and wine that's again, uh, compelling and, and, and expressive, uh, and interesting uh, beyond just developing appreciation for that and developing better palate. Um, what I have really come to understand is how uh, to create a whole farm system within a vineyard. Um, to you know, one of one of the the main roles that I have been brought on to do here is to you know further develop our livestock and poultry programs and. Uh, and, and to rotationally graze the vineyards, to move the sheep and the chickens through the vineyards, as well as 
the pastures, the hay field after we've cut the hay. And in fact, we've got a couple of irrigated lawns here around one of the rental houses. And we move the animals through these irrigated lawns. And now we have irrigated pasture that we can graze and we don't have to mow the lawns and we burn less fuel and the sheep deposit manure when they, when they leave and they fertilize it. So, you know, seeing, seeing these opportunities to take what is a vineyard site that has, you know, this, this really amazing product that comes out of it, that is wine and to start to diversify that both in terms of, our product offerings, you know, with this, this year, we'll be selling chicken eggs, we'll be selling vegetables that we're growing um, here at the tasting room, we're going to have a farm stand available. And so not only are we diversifying our business opportunities and our and our chances to, um, you know, hopefully fund this, this transition. Um, but we're also, we're, we're, we're growing healthy food. We're growing biodynamic vegetables and eggs for our community. Um, you know, we're really hopefully supporting the nutrition of our community and, um, you know, real recognizing, recognizing the potential, uh, of integrating these systems within a vineyard, but then also how the vineyard feeds back into that. Um, has become really interesting. You know, I've never worked with pumice or the, the byproduct of winemaking, all the crushed grapes and stems and stuff in composting. This is a really cool experience to see uh, both how microbially alive pumice is, uh, how rich in nitrogen and these other, you know, yummy foods for the organisms that are responsible for composting is. And you know, so we're taking these this pumice and incorporating it back into the compost, which we're then incorporating back into the vineyard systems, and starting to to see these these cycles throughout the year and and, and these feedback loops and how supportive and regenerative they are in nature um, has been a really cool part of working in a vineyard system. Um, in addition to just increasing my appreciation for wine. So you're on the board of the Josephine Porter Institute. I think we should let you plug the, the Institute a little bit and also tell people how they can find out if they want to introduce biodynamics into their garden at home, some of the resources available to them. Well, thank you. I would love that opportunity. Yeah, the Josephine Porter Institute or JPI as we commonly call it um, is a nonprofit that's based in Floyd, Virginia. Um, our mission is to heal the planet through biodynamic agriculture, simply put. Um, what we, the ways we do that are um, we make and sell biodynamic preparations, those um, eight or nine unique compounds, as well as a few other um, preparations. Uh, and we make them on site in Floyd, Virginia, and we sell them to biodynamic practitioners all over the world. Um, you know, I think there's a real a real benefit of doing the prep work yourself. I've related it very often to a meditation practice or a yoga practice. I think preparation making is a practice that deepens your connection to the herbs and animals that uh, you know are part of your farm. It, it, can, it connects you to seasonal rhythms. And whereas preparation making can be a, a really beautiful um, exploration of yourself, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult part for uh, a newcomer to biodynamics to just break into. And so JPI provides this opportunity for especially farms, as well as just your backyard gardener, your backyard orchardist to start to introduce the biodynamic preparations into their farming systems by purchasing them and supporting our nonprofit work. And the other way that people can get involved is through workshops and education. We host workshops in Floyd, Virginia at the farm that we are making and selling the preps. Um, and we also hope to expand that in the future this year and in coming years to start to support other regional prep making groups. You know, there's a wonderfully active group here in Oregon. Um, there's a great group in Northern California. There's these wonderful regional groups all over the, the country. And I think JPI can play a really central role in starting to connect the dots, starting to connect some of these practitioners in disseminating um, information about biodynamics, uh, in, uh, sh spreading and sharing prep making practices. And we do that, uh, one way that we do that is with a journal. We publish Applied Biodynamics, 
which you can get quarterly either in your mail or as a electronic subscription. And it's just full of great case studies, information about preparations, information about practically applying biodynamics, which I think is really interesting to me being a farmer. Uh, it, it, it takes some of the theory out of it and really brings it home to your garden or to your orchard or to large vineyards, which are also clients who purchase uh, preparations to help in the process of becoming biodynamic certified. And until those big organizations or businesses are able to produce preps on site, JPI can sort of fill that gap by selling you preparations to apply on your farm and to meet those certification standards that Demeter uh, requires. Personal level, how, how does biodynamics meant to you and help you grow as a person? Yeah, I think that is, um, I think that is, like I was just saying, the real nature of the prep work. Um, I've had this opportunity, particularly when I was at Apricot Lane, to share with woofers the practice of preparation making and the practice of biodynamics. And, you know, there's, there's nothing that really demonstrates to a teacher uh, what you don't know is, is, is by teaching it, I guess is what I mean to say. And, get, and having so many opportunities of so many woofers come through and stay with us for three months and getting to uh, maybe as redundant as it might seem to some people, the, for me to be able to practice explaining um, these concepts that can be maybe heady, can be difficult to wrap your brain around, can feel to some people as unscientific. Um, it really helped reveal to me uh, the gaps in my own knowledge, the gaps in my own understanding. And I continue to recognize those own gaps and to continue practicing and learning um, every year. And, and as, as we've, uh, taken on more and more layers of prep making here at Troon, I've continued to, to deepen this practice and, and, and understanding. And I think one of the things that I really love sharing with woofers, even though they would only come to us for three months, you know, only part of a season, um, I, I would love sort of sharing, for example, how preparation 500 or the horn manure preparation uh, involves burying horns in the fall to sort of channel that, that winter energy or what I think of as this earthly in-breath, right? You know, the rain starts falling, the leaves start falling, the earth breathes in, it starts to decompose all the fallen leaves, it starts to feed the microorganisms, it starts to um, really increase soil fertility in preparation for this big outbreath in the following spring. Sorry, it's time to go take care of the animals. <laughs> My <laughs> alarm is going off that the dogs are hungry and the chickens. Okay, well, they, we don't want to leave them hungry. So, so yeah. thank no, you. That's thank it. you for this time, Garrett. It's been really interesting. Uh, there's so many exciting projects you have going here. We really encourage people to actually come out to the farm. Uh, we're working on some tours and experiences yes. for the summer, and you will you can actually uh, see what we're doing. Yes, yes. Can't wait to share the farm with you all. <laughs>